to his right. End zone shot. Metcalf for the score. First and goal. One on one at the top with DK Metcalf. Here is Walker for the touchdown. This was picked. Back the other way, Witherspoon. Devin Witherspoon cuts back. What a night for the rookie. You think they love him in Seattle? How about six points? Touchdown, Witherspoon. No flags. You know, typically with these island games, we like to give you that little buffet of highlights and we'll mix in, you know, one from one of the losing team and then a couple from the winning team. But some games, you got to go triple play for the victor. And this was that case for the Seattle Seahawks who went to the Meadowlands and really put the put the giant season I don't want to get crazy here, and we'll get to it, but to me, kind of on ice in some ways, uh, with a 24-3 win uh, in front of 75, let's say about 66,000 furious Giants fans and about 10,000 uh, delirious Seattle fans, or at least that's how it sounded as they took over that building uh, in the swamp late in the game. Uh, a dominating performance by the defense of the Seahawks. Uh, Bobby Wagner, one of four Seahawks, uh, to have two sacks in this game. I believe they had 11 total, and it was that pick six that put the game away. But in many ways, uh, this was uh, really as one-sided as it gets, even if the score wasn't quite as dramatic as one would say for a total boat race. Dan Hans is here with Greg Rosenthal and Mark Sessler on a Monday night. Uh, Greggy, um, you love your Seahawks. You love your Geno Smith. Um, but this is like, this is a beautiful win for Pete Carroll's team. And you could tell by Carroll's reaction on the sideline, this is right up his alley. He's going to sleep well tonight. Yeah. Cause all he's wanted for what? Eight years now is to bring it back, bring it back to those Legion of boom defenses that they celebrated in 2013. Just a week ago, they had a big celebration in Seattle. It was all the players coming back except for one player who's still on the team that they were celebrating. And that's Bobby Wagner. And him being one of the guys with two sacks to me was fitting because they had 11 sacks. Just It's just bonkers. This has not been a good defense this year. I think they have the pieces to get better. Stomping on incompetent opposition is a sign of a good defense. But Wagner is part of a second level of a defense that got those sacks. You mentioned that the four guys got two. Jordan Brooks was one of them. Devin Witherspoon was one of them. He had the game... Uh, of the year, I think uh, any rookie has had on defense. And then Nuoso had the other two. It it was just crazy. And they have playmakers on those second level. And when you're playing the Giants, everyone looks like they have defensive playmakers because they can't block anyone. Yeah, I mean, it, it was the perfect storm of like absolutely celebrating what the Seahawks did. But you are facing a Giants line that um, already arguably the worst line in the league had no Andrew Thomas. Um, they lost their starting center, John Michael Schmitz, in the middle of the game early on. And it just seemed like um, a fiery, angry boulder rolling downhill because it became almost uh, an absurd sporting event to me to watch. Because it, 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 you know, it was like, you're not going to win this game. Like, we're, you're just simply, we're watching Daniel Jones, who is a massive athletic man being punished over and over. And it's like every couple seconds, another takedown, another sack. And I don't really remember a game like that because this was only one sack away from the NFL record of 12. And this is a very kind of rare event. And it like for the Giants, I think like, you know, Dan and I were both friends with a ton of Giants fans. It's like the hope is receding and disappearing with each drive that crumbles into nothingness. There's no explosive plays. And you can criticize Daniel Jones. I don't really because it's like, he yes he's indecisive um yes he's getting nothing done back there but go find me a quarterback that can survive behind the offensive line as it currently stands for the Giants yeah and you have it's interesting and it's crazy because no one got more praise and rightfully so the way Brian Dable took this Giants team from dumpster fire under Joe Judge to a really cohesive uh 
strong-willed team that played tough every week. Even the games the Giants didn't win last year, many of them, they were competitive in the losses. They get to the playoffs, didn't. They got a win in the playoffs. And, you know, this team now, a year later, they look, uh, dare I say, poorly coached? Or is it is it the personnel that's that much worse this year? I don't know. And I think when you saw, and a great job, and it's one of the benefits um, of these primetime games because you have such great coverage and so many cameras and, and you know, they're capturing everything. So many cutaways to the, the Giants fans because and just they're stunned, they're angry because this was not supposed to be this season. And I think that's what you're trying to now figure out how this team that with the same coaching staff, when everybody was saying they are on the right track and they're a smart, uh, well-coached team that's getting better. Uh, now they look like one of the worst teams in football through four weeks. And I think that's been one of the bigger surprises of the league for me. They, they had a shot of a, a fan with a brown paper bag on. And I, I think this was <laughs> such a, a perfect night for what you were talking about. I don't think Brian Dable is a bad coach. But there was one team in this game that was missing both starting tackles and were playing like late round afterthoughts at tackles and then lost both their starting guards in this game and won the game 24 to three. Now the Seahawks offense was no great shakes in this game either. They, they missed some opportunities. They didn't top 300 yards. They scored, I guess, 17 points as an offense, but they looked like they made sense. They had positive plays. They certainly had, you know, a quarterback who wasn't making as many negative plays, but I'm with you, Mark. This wasn't a game that to me was on Daniel Jones for the most part, and I'm always happy to blame Daniel Jones for things because when he was at the back of his drop on most of those sacks, the, the pressure was there. It was instant. Like this, his first fumble came from one of the many plays where he avoided a sack, and that was because there was an absolutely free rusher, but it wasn't like a creative defensive blitz. It was Uchenna Nuoso, their edge rusher, who was just completely unblocked, and they only rushed four on that play. So it was like a total meltdown and you lose your center at the beginning of the game. That hurts. But I think you, you can give credit to the Seahawks for like, look, they're making it work. Shane Waldron and making their offense very functional and the giants can't. So that's personnel, but that that's coaching too. Yeah. I mean, I think there's like, you ask, is he, uh, is it a Brian Dable thing? I mean, I, I give him credit for last year. I mean, coaching is human too. And like the locker room presence and who he was, was like embraced for a lot of good reasons and he, and he brought results. But right now they have PFF's 31st ranked offense and defense going into tonight. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to the offense after that. And I'd argue that the, the special teams has been equally a huge problem. That's the three things that make up your organization and your success over the course of a campaign. They've been getting, they've scored three points in the entire first quarter, in the first quarter all season long. They've been outscored 77 to nine in the first half. So that changes everything you do coming out of half. And like, they've had some of the worst quarters we've seen by any team. And I just like, to me, it's the, it's like the, the, I don't know what to do about this, but these teams should not be treating us on national television. I don't care what time of year They're it on is. Sunday night football in two weeks. I know the best it's like, it's four league, times in six Bills. weeks. And it's, it's not, it's just like, it's for their fans and Jets fans, you know this too. It's just like, it's we've got to find a solution to this. That's a separate topic, but it, it it's just like we're in the, we're two quarters into this game, and I'm thinking this is utterly absurd to yeah, put in front of an international audience. It, with the two New York teams, and it's both of them, and it's doubled up, and they're both having uh, bad years so far. And yeah. It's mm. on New York City. Such a beautiful voice. It's on Sad. New York City. And I'm wearing my uh, my Knickerbockers hat today. The New York Knicks, uh, the NBA. Um, the Yankees are out of the playoffs this year. The Mets didn't make it. Had one of the more disappointing years ever uh, for their big budget. And the Jets had Aaron Rodgers. And then we know what happened there. And the Giants. What's happening here? Uh, now we got to go in all in the Knicks. Uh, and I guess the Rangers and whatever major league soccer clubs happen to be in the tri-state area. I'm not. Well, you got a WNBA finals team right now, the Liberty versus uh, Tom Brady's aces. So okay, you stay on top of that if you can for me and just let me know because those flags fly forever as well. That's true. But um, it is it's so frustrating because um, like from a New York sports fan perspective, it's been a pretty dark ride in the wilderness for 
you know, most of the century uh, for the New York sports teams and, and for the NFL teams, this was supposed to be like a great uh, year of growth and maybe even the Jets are a potential Super Bowl team and the Giants were going to hang in this beastly NFC East. And let's face it, like what I said at the top of the show is, yeah, this feels with the schedule the way it is. They have they're in Miami next week. And I think, like you said, they got Buffalo and Sunday night football the, the week after that. And, you know, you're staring down the barrel one of five and a good night nurse. So Bill, the Giants and Dable's got a huge head, job ahead of him now to try to keep this locker room from not completely uh, burning down under all the disappointment. And for the Seattle side of things, stick a fork in him. Ugh. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> would be willing to stick a fork in the Giants wow. at this stage. It just had that feeling to me. Um, that it's just not going to be their year. And, and for the Seahawks, you know, they had one really bad loss, Greg. Uh, week one against a Rams team that now, in retrospect, was not nearly uh, as big an upset as it seemed at the time because the Rams turned out to be pretty damn feisty this year. Uh, but since then, they beat the Lions in week two. Uh, they took care of business against the Panthers last week. They whooped the Giants this week. And now they go to Cincinnati. Uh, and look at you off to a, what are you, 4-0? Oh? Or no. Okay. Well, I'm right Locked behind you, baby Seahawks. boy. They were an underdog at the time. I think eventually all the, the casuals like me kept uh, putting money on them and they became the favorite. So, that, And with this pass rush uh, against a weak offensive line or a quarterback who's compromised like they're getting next week, again, Joe Burrow, he, he could be a tasty lunch for this defense the way they played today. Yeah, and they get a bye week before that. I think that's huge. They get, They're getting into the bye three and one. They've had – almost as many injuries as any team in football. So the bye week is big for them. They have their offensive linemen, but the, the pass rush and the defense in general has come along and Pete Carroll defenses, even throughout this six or seven years of mediocrity, usually start out terrible. There's actually DVOA stats about this where September, they're always bottom five and then they improve and they end up being average. They usually end up being a little better than average down the stretch. And I think there's a very real reason for it this year. It's their two cornerbacks. Reek Willen missed a couple weeks. He was back in there today, almost had an interception himself. And then Devin Witherspoon. That's one of the best games I've ever seen out of a cornerback ever. For, forget a, oh. forget a rookie oh, I love and that, I, Greg. Hyperbole. It's back, baby. I mean, it was just fun to watch. I know, like, it wasn't all in coverage. I, you'd have to go watch all the coverage snaps. But in terms of just making plays on the ball with those sacks, those instinctual plays on one that was going to be a trick play where Paris Campbell was going to throw it, and he recognized it immediately. And some of the tackles were just crazy. That's not what you think of when you think of a cornerback. But Devin Witherspoon is just a playmaker. And – even in his first game, I said he was the main character of the game and it was like a lot bad and some good. He's just like, he pops off the screen. He was incredible last week. He was even better this week. And he seems the embodiment of whatever Pete Carroll wants in a defender. Like he's Seattle all the way. I feel like a lot of Weatherspoon jerseys were sold tonight. I also like that from a broadcasting angle, um, because you're right, he popped off the screen that Troy Aikman um, had a major win because before the 97-yard pick six occurred, he mentioned Weatherspoon like probably six or seven times. At one point, he said he reminds me of another 21 that I know, Deion Sanders, with his bravado. Mm. It's like he kept propping him up, and then bang, the pick six happened, and like the announcer's booth was relatively quiet. And you're like, you know that Aikman's up there just being like, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I nailed that. Uh, Geno Smith, uh, quiet game statistically, and he left this game for a series, and shout out Drew Locke came in. Uh, connected with Noah Fant on a catch and run that really put the game uh, in control for Seattle uh, for about a 50 yard gain. Um, I like that taunting penalty Gino got. He, he is speaking of feisty. He's feisty as well. I think well, he got it. He got admonished by Troy, by the way, for that, which is like, you're the quarterback. You got to be a little more under control, but I didn't mind it, Greg. I, I thought Gino showed a little fire. He didn't like the, the hit that led to his injury on the sideline and in general seem to have an issue with some of the Giants defenders. Well, yeah, I think there was a question whether whether that was a late hit or, or a dirty hit. I like, started just as he was going out of bounds and then really continued and rolled up. And so he was angry about that. And I think the reason he was so mad, and this is just a guess, they didn't guess on the broadcast, was Tyler Lockett got hit in a very similar fashion just as he was going out of bounds right when Geno came back in. And it was that play 
where he ended up getting the penalty. And yeah, they didn't they didn't need much out of him. He actually made a couple of really nice plays um, moving inside the pocket. But I felt like every nice play he made or that they were making was getting called back by penalty. I mean, they were sloppy as hell on offense. And that's the thing where you're watching this game and you're thinking, man, if the Giants could either make some big plays defensively or had any sort of an offense, Seattle was leaving the door open, especially in the first half of this game for the Giants to show up because they were just making so many mental errors and the Giants just weren't ready. I mean, it could have been a th- if Eli, if, uh, Eli, if uh, Daniel Jones doesn't throw the pick six, they're at the five yard line there. You got a touchdown to go for two. It's a three point game going into the fourth quarter. Uh, so that was obviously a massive game ending swing. The pick six, uh, the only person probably not smiling, uh, connected to the Seahawks tonight is Jamal Adams, who finally returned. This was actually tough to see just because I it reminded me when he, you know, he had his great moments with the Jets. Things got ugly, he gets traded there. And it's been a pretty rough ride after that first season when he had all those sacks. And he finally gets on the field after missing like a year and a half, about a uh, year and a quarter. And on um, the first series, he gets kneed in the helmet by Daniel Jones, uh, clearly woozy. It was the right move to pull him out of the game. The independent specialist on the sideline ruled him out and he has words with them. And it seemed to be, had to be separated from the independent neurologist, which I feel like is a first, I don't think I've ever seen like that situation play out before. Uh, so that was a bit of a bummer to see. And then my, my final, uh, takeaway on this rather mundane game, uh, is, uh, I, I did a double screen watch on this one. I came back to the Manning cast for the first time in um quite a while it was very it was delightful i just it's such a great product and i'm going to continue to two screen it for the rest of the season um they even had will ferrell on and that was nice and even our nfl media colleague uh sean o'hara stepped in and made a joke about uh um eli putting his hands between his legs that old center cornerback humor (laughs) fun stuff (laughs) you you love that (laughs) waka waka Anything else, I Mark? Manning cast. Um, I love the Manning cast. I, I think like uh, others have tried to duplicate versions of it, and you can't. But I would say this. Um, what, you mean like us on our NFL Plus Monday show? I would point to that as something that I'm hoping we're not trying to duplicate. What they're no, doing. we're that doing not, a, I, a, a sure recap. I, Today's one with Colts Rams was a, a delight for the senses. No, yeah, we're, we're, we're well, I think it would be intellectually new. disingenuous to say that our Monday stream is not somewhat um, not modeled after it, but you know, uh, visually it, it would be a striking coincidence. And it's, it's just, there's <laughs> something really to me, almost wholesome about the two brothers, just kind of watching this game and seeing how they interact with each other and talk about the game as two kind of famous quarterbacks, one, a legendary star and one, even though Greg will try to stop it, who will go into the hall of fame one day. Uh, just a great program. Well, I think uh, both of them, I, I saw a clip going around of them just kind of admiring and in a real quarterbacky way, Geno Smith, like play action fakes, like Peyton Manning, who was just like the master of the play action <laughs> fake was just like, Oh, Gino, like he has been going to play action fake school. And it is one of the things I like about Gino. He's, he's good at all the, the right, he threw for stuff. like 110 yards today. I Can mean, we just if there was ever a, a night to pipe down week. just a tad, maybe even three to four percent oh, on this topic. I mean, he goes back to New York and wins a game. Pete Carroll goes to New York and wins. Literally, a game. no They're one cares about him. that but you. There is okay. no going back to the Giants to win a game. It's not a thing. Did okay. seem testy against the Giants though tonight. Seemed he, to be something there a little he, bit. He maybe. was. He was. Well, he a thought somebody feisty. tried to give him a double ACL tear on a tackle on the sideline. He's yeah. That I I hope that. This isn't something that you hear afterwards that they do tests and MRI and it ends up turning into something more like a, a sprain that, that keeps them out. The bye week seems well-timed. What A couple of la- quick last things, just like the, the Giants attempted two passes over 10 yards. They attempted to. That's not that's insane Mm-mm. for the amount of dropbacks that Daniel Jones had 34 plus the 11 sacks. So that's plus the scrambles. He dropped back almost 50 times and he didn't have time to – Throw it more than 10 yards down the field. That's a catastrophe. Yeah, by the Darren way, speaking Waller's of the Manning cast, J- uh, Tennessee alum Peyton Manning losing his mind that they're not even finding any way to get Jalen Hyde right. involved, the guy who's an absolute playmaker. Just just a nightmare evening. It's for a mess. The it's hard to get Hyatt involved, though, when, I mean, I don't know, tonight especially your quarterback's got 
right half of a second half of a millimeter to throw the ball like i don't if they do indeed have good coaching there there there's a way to clean this stuff up during the week it's going to be a huge test for dable and the entire coach of the year platform Let's, mm. let's be honest. Well, let's let's be real. Coach of the year. I said how defense matters a lot in terms of the schedule you play. I think if you looked at old coach of the year winners, I think schedule matters a lot. We've had some yes. Dick Durans and Matt Nagy's and it just guys <laughs> that get to 11 wins off of a, a weird schedule. One tiny fly in the ointment for the Seahawks. Yes. Is, I, I've been noticing this year. The last one for me is just Jackson Smith and Jigba. They tried to get him involved. Six targets, five yards. A drop. We get excited couldn't, about the rookie couldn't beat wide a receiver. guy in the Sometimes open field. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Yeah, and so many receivers have come into the league. Mark, Mark, you you smartly mentioned Michael Wilson today. So many receivers coming to the league flying, and they've really struggled to get any production or, or anything going for him. And I think they really tried tonight, and it just it wasn't happening. That's like the eighth um, summer long narrative that we based it ourselves in. I did on the Jackson Smith and Jigba thing, and it's not panning out. I, I don't know if maybe we should be, you know put in a box in the summer because it's just it's becoming embarrassing we will a couple years a couple years we'll just shut it down for the summer see you in september everybody <laughs> big old wave um all right that's it uh for for this game uh let's now pivot now and get you caught up to date on all of the news i kind of like that as a segment i feel like i brought it up and then we never actually do it because it doesn't sound overly pleasant but I feel like an October check-in on what we were most wrong about um, in terms of what we were talking about mm. ceaselessly in August and into September. Uh, things that surprised us. That could be something. The Steelers' offense is up there. They are dead last in an EP per play. I was buying it, too. Pre- almost anything that happened in the preseason now that I'm thinking about it. Like, C.J. Stroud was the quarterback people were worried about. Come, Everyone's thrilled about side, Dorian guys. Thompson Robinson. Join me. It's so I'm, much I'm, better. It, it, it's the you. final weeks of your summer. Just savor them. Me, me standing on the away. table in the, in the fantasy spectacular as my one main thing to draft Damian Pierce. I guess it looks a little better after this last week. I'm not totally giving up at that. that Look, the Steelers can still win 12 games. I'm not completely. <laughs> that's not completely The door is lost. not closed. The door is not closed. Let's do some news. The door is not. Speaking of the Steelers, pivot. Did that, that was pro. That was good. Kenny Pickett suffered a knee injury in that uh, dreadful loss uh, this week to the Texans. Wow, look at all these things tying together. Um, and it seemed like a bad injury at the time. But here's the good news. Uh, Rap Sheet reports that Pickett has a, a bone bruise in his knee. Uh, could miss week five against the Ravens. Um, it's also a muscle strain, according to Rappaport. Uh, but he's it, it's in play that he could be on the field this week. Uh, but they have a bye in week six. So there's a pretty decent chance we're going to see Mitch Trubisky um, this weekend. Uh, but also a pretty decent chance, uh, unless hmm, unless Mitch Trubisky balls out, uh, that Kenny Pickett will be back on the field as opposed to a worst-case scenario, which seemed in play when he went down on Sunday. It's like the inverse scenario from a year ago where we were waiting and knowing that Mitch Trubisky would have essentially at some point be benched or injured or removed from the lineup. And you come into this season with these glowing reports of, of Kenny Pickett um, that I fell for like a complete rube um, based off of July action and August action. And he's not looked apart. And so I have to question like if he, if there were no injury or no injury, like would he be on a leash? Because I thought that, Tomlin's comments after that game were very mm. Mike Tomlin. It was just like, yeah, major changes could be coming and really no one's safe. And it's like, I think that when you say that, you're not talking about your left defensive tackle. You're talking about the quarterback situation. Mm. I think uh, you're right. I think Mitch ahead. Trubisky is an upgrade. I, the smallest hill I'll ever die on is that Mitch Trubisky, when he came back in for the Steelers last year, played pretty well. Mm. It, it's very similar to my Andy Dalton was sneaky good for the uh, Saints last year, which which is another one that I feel like is this actually is like an aging. anthill, right? Yeah, it yeah. is, but it's aging okay because like Derek Carr <laughs> looks a hell of a lot like uh, Andy Dalton or worse right now in that offense. I was just like, I'm just saying it's not a good situation. I think Trubisky could be an upgrade on what Pickett is now. Now, how much of it is just the offense is totally broken? Pickett's taken a huge step back from where Pickett was even as a rookie. I mean, that's. It's not even arguable. He he's really struggling. So I think Trubisky has been around 
could be an upgrade. And if he plays well enough, I think Tomlin is, I guess, I don't know what the word is, practical enough that he would keep Trubisky in. Blame Canada. Uh, <laughs> in other news, uh, hey, the Colts, they're inching toward getting Jonathan Taylor back on the f- field. Shane Steichen, we, we're pivoting now to talking the, the team of Zeus TL, who were covered with great fanfare along with the Los Angeles Rams on NFL Plus in our ATN Game of the Week, uh, which is, um, what is the word? It is A pristine. Feast for the senses? No, I'm saying like it is it is a show that is indebted to the Manning cast, but also cast its own shadow. How about that? It's not derivative. <laughs> right. We're it's not visually familiar. Right. It's it's like a two and a half hour shorter. There's not a live <laughs> game that we're watching. Anyway, we did Rams Colts. Check that out on NFL plus great game. Uh, Shane Steichen, the coach of the Colts, said there's a chance Jonathan Taylor could be on the field at week five against the Titans. Of course, he started the league the season on the pup list uh, with an ankle injury that may or may not still be a thing. Everything, of course, is connected to a very gnarly uh, contract dispute uh, between Taylor and management. The Colts opened up the 21 day practice window, which means uh, they have three weeks to kind of get him um, onto the field. And it does seem like that could happen as soon as, as uh, this week, uh, Steichen said there could be, yeah, uh, when asked about the chances that he plays uh, Sunday. So that's great news for the Colts. I'm and I, I like I, Zach Moss, but he's not hes not Jonathan Taylor. I'm shocked. I mean, I was not expecting this because he – I want to hear from Jonathan Taylor first, actually, before I get too excited about it. Jonathan Taylor has not spoken to the media since July, I believe. That's and fair. so we, we haven't really known what's going on, but I just was expecting this to stay as ugly as possible. And if they get him back, woo, I mean, that, this this division's wide open. To that point, uh, Greg, the reporting out there as le- recently as last week was that Taylor was still digging in his heels. So maybe either that was erroneous reporting or something had changed between then and now. But uh, it's certainly... Listen, Taylor has, as frustrated as he is, Mark, he has a reason to get back on the field as well uh, because he is playing, trying to get paid at some point and just disappearing uh, for the whole year uh, is not going to work for him as, at all. So I well, guess it makes this, sense. This tells me like two things. One, that the Colts, who didn't seem like too hot on trading him um, or doing anything with him, and like you got ownership sort of just digging in their heels, as you say, like, there were no major trade offers that ever came even behind the scenes. So he's not able to go anywhere else. And if he doesn't play or if he's not physically able to perform by week six, then he loses an accrued year on his rookie contract and he's not a free agent after this season. So I think he's, uh, you know, I don't know how he's being, you know, guided by his agent and stuff, but um, I think there'd be a massive motivation to get back on the field, finish out the season if you have nowhere, if you can't go anywhere else. And then go to free agency. I mean, they, they're not going to franchise him with this situation. Hmm. A lot of motivation, too, I think, because he heard that I took him in my running back draft. And they were like, wow, that would Mark, do it. And, Mark and Dan really made fun <laughs> of uh, my guy Greg for taking me and Kamara and B- Bijan in the running back draft. I want to prove Greg right. That, that's just what do they call it when they put the, the pig on the thing and it spins with the apple in the mouth? Is that a, a spit roast? That, that was Greg. Yeah. That was Greg when we did the running back draft. Just a tough, not from us even, Greg. A lot of the criticism coming from outside uh, the walls of your fortress. Well, it was put get, up to you, a... You didn't get that right. There was a public poll. I mean, you can blame the two of yeah. us, but like the, the public largely weighed in, and they deemed the results, not, not the two of us. <laughs> you know oh, what? yeah. I mean, you got to trust the public. They, we they, should they probably make stop the best honking. decisions on, in elections. Forget about it. <laughs> we should probably stop honking and check who we all drafted and see where that is. Uh, Eric Roberts behind the virtual glass. Can you check in on that uh, and get us that info um, at some point? Uh, also uh, heading back to the field for week five, Desmond Ritter, the Atlanta Falcons quarterback who is struggled uh, through much of this season and really did not do himself any favors in London in a in a tough loss to the Jaguars. It's led to a lot of heat around uh, Arthur Smith to make a change at QB, but Smith is standing by his guy. Here is uh, Smith's comments on the situation. 
Just as a follow up, you, you didn't, is this Desmond still your starter? Just to be clear, by court, look, obviously, I wouldn't be sitting there and get on that pontificating about what went on in the game if we're making a change. Right. That right now, but you know, and we saw what happened on the sidelines with Mac Hollins, which is actually even worse when you watched it on replay where he missed Hollins and then he went to dap him up and Hollins gave him a look like, are you even kidding me right now, bro? He's losing that locker room and, and Smith risks losing the locker room as well. So this is, I would think guys that this is, this is it for Desmond Ritter in terms of play well this week, or you're going to take it almost out of Smith's hands. Cause he knows he'll have to make the change to stave off a revolt. That's kind of how these things tend to go. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is like, if you get a coach or an organization that's like, sold or bought into like draft pedigree well he doesn't have that um it's it th th there wasn't much mu there's not a lot of stakes in desmond ritter outside the fact that you know we got glowing remarks from the owner and the coach all off season and we've gotten an, it's fair to give him a test and, and he's failing and he's letting the team down a pretty talented roster and i just think it's like if you had no one behind him like when we talk about pulling Burrow, and I'm, I'm really with you on the concept of why they might do this, like the problem with him is they've got nothing behind him. But Taylor Heineke, uh, just literally a year ago, came in around midseason and brought a little bit of life. He's not, he's imperfect, I get it, but he brought some juice and some energy to the commanders, and he's the same guy. And it's like, I, I think Taylor Heineke and this offense is almost a much what must watch sooner than later. And it's, they're a weird team because they didn't take a bye after London. They have to go right back and face the Texans. And it's like, I wonder if there was a buy and they had more time to marinate in this, that maybe they make a change, or do we just need one more terrible mm. Ritter start? And that's because of them. They request that. Usually there is a buy. The only reason they wouldn't have a buy is they say, we don't want it then. And now they face uh, a team that, oh, I'll save it for Wednesday, but this, this team's kind of entering my heart. Just just saying. Maybe it's entering the whole... Mm, stick side. a pin in it, Greggy. I like that. Uh, let's go through some other injuries uh, from around the league coming out of Sunday. Tough, tough, uh, really one of the worst Sundays in recent memory for the Patriots. The worst blowout of the Belichick era, uh, era and their two best young defensive players go out with injuries. Matthew Judon uh, is out indefinitely with a biceps injury. It's a lower bicep tendon tear. Um, he's going to miss multiple weeks. Uh, he could land on injured reserve. So it's kind of a wait and see when they get Judon back, if they get him at all. Also, Christian Gonzalez, who's really immediately stepped in and become kind of a stud cornerback for this team. Uh, he went down awkwardly on his shoulder, and he is out indefinitely uh, with a shoulder injury. Uh, with this also, we don't know exactly how long he's going to be out, but indefinitely is never what you want to hear. And this is the defensive player of the month. Uh, last weekend as a rookie. So uh, double double setback, Greggy, and it's kind of coming from all sides for Belichick right now. This is, you know, the biggest, you know, most unique test of Belichick, I think, since he's been in New England in terms of his job security. Now, there there was a minute when they were 0-2 in 2001. They were already chattering about it a little bit in Boston because he started 5-11, and then 0-2. But this is everything happening all at once. They do have the softest part of their schedule coming up. In theory, it's such a hard schedule, but they have the Saints and the Raiders. But the Saints or the Raiders are also looking at the Patriots and being like, ooh, we got a soft part of our schedule coming up. It's the Patriots. Yeah, it's a defensive-built team, <laughs> which I innately don't trust, um, that lost Marcus Jones, Jack Jones, Jonathan Jones, everyone with the last name of Jones. You've now lost Gonzalez. Judon had 32 sacks in 35 games as a really good you know, free agent pickup. But this is their identity, and they're losing it piece by piece. And like that offense under duress um, is is an eyesore. It's possibly their two best players on the team, Judon and Gonzalez, right now. That's great. Not good. Not good. Uh, other injury news: uh, Rap Sheet reports that Justin Herbert broke a finger on his non non throwing hand in that Week Four win over the Raider Raiders. Um, he not a pleasant thing, but the idea is that it is not a serious injury. Um, they have a bye in week five, which is ideal. A few of the week five, your Cleveland Browns, Mark, another team that perfectly timed by for them as well with their quarterback dealing with some health issues. So he gets two weeks before the Cowboys on Monday Night Football, and we'll see where he is by then. I would imagine that he will play. And I just want to give a shout-out to Justin Herbert uh, because I did uh, talk about earlier in the season um, – you know, wanting to see him with those big dagger plays to put teams away and, and take his team to the finish line. And we kind of glossed over it a little bit. Uh, just a beautiful uh, deep strike on third and 10 
to put that game away after the Asante Samuel bizarre step out of bounds uh, after the interception late in that game. So that was a money throw from a banged up Herbert and you love to see it. And they're back to 500 and hopefully they'll have them on the field when they play again. Also out Teron Armstead, the Dolphins left tackle. He will not play in week five against the Giants. Uh, this is a injury plagued player, but a great player when he's on the field. McDaniel said that he believes that Armstead will play again this season, but uh, this seems like a week to week injury. When you say that they're going to play again this season, that that always is very concerning, especially for a player that I feel like is an injury or two away from, you know, wondering if this is worth it because he he's crazy on the injury report. They list Taron Armstead with like four different injuries. I've never seen it before. It's like knee, ankle, shoulder. What? It's like a bunch of different things. And this seemed, one seems serious. It sounded like it, just reading between the lines that it, it's probably month or month at least. And they're not the same without him. Yeah, it was such a. It. I mean, it was you know vague in terms of any sort of timeline. He had left knee surgery in the off season. Um, you're right. He's always banged up, and they were so different without him a year ago. And it just it it you just wonder how many people they can lose on the offensive line and like he is sort of a Jenga piece for them. They have Kendall Lamb, kind of a quality player, but Teran Armstead is sort of irreplaceable. Uh, other injury news: we saw this coming, and you heard from the comments from Sean McDermott that it, it was not good news around Tre'Davious White. But the veteran cornerback did indeed suffer a torn Achilles in the Bills' Week Four win over those Dolphins, so his season is over. He's now suffered season ending injuries in two of his last three years. He tore an ACL in 2021. So you lose an all pro and that team got worse and they have to find a way to make it work without him. Do they have the dogs uh, to, to, to back them up, uh, Greggy? I mean, they have a first round pick Kyrie Elam, who's been a healthy scratch at points this season that they could really use to step up. No, I would say cornerback was one of the thinnest positions on their team. They have Teron Johnson, who's a good slot corner. Christian Benford is this late round pick from a year ago who stepped up and has been solid, but that's one of their thinner spots and Poyer's injured. It's, it's something, it's something to attack if you're Buffalo or yes. you're playing Buffalo. And guess what? The trade deadline is a little less than one month away. And we talked about it. Mark, you and I were in lockstep on it entering the season the urgency is through the roof for this Bills team, this mm. core. Uh, if you think you need it, go get it. Go use use some draft capital and, and add some depth to that secondary if if need be. So they that feels mm. like a potential uh, area. Giants could be sellers. Uh, Adoree Jackson is a, a guy on their team who I feel like could still have some good football in them. Might be is available. Is this you're the GM? Are we doing an epic you're the GM? All right. <laughs> Let's do that later this month. Yeah, uh, and we'll just uh, button up a couple other things. So Chase Claypool, you know the drama there about the wide receiver traded for the number 32 overall pick just last year at the trade deadline, buyer beware. Uh, and now uh, because of comments he's made in general lack of effort at other times on the field and just being a knucklehead has fallen out of favor with the Bears. And then some weird messaging because everything with the Bears is just a little messed up these days or a lot messed up where Ibra Flus first kind of let the, the media know that it was the team's uh, or it was the player's decision not to be uh, at the Broncos game. And then it was clarified that it was the team's decision. And Ibra Flus said Monday that Claypool will remain away from the team ahead of week, the week five matchup with the commanders. Here's something from Flus to correct the record uh, for chase Clay, uh, Claypool. Uh, we did tell him, um, you know, not to be here for the weekend, including the game. Uh, we told him he'd be inactive, inactive on Saturday. Um, you know, and this morning uh, we informed him that he's not going to be here this week um, uh, for the game as well. And uh, we just feel that's best for the team um, at this time. So, uh, and again, Ryan and I um, have informed him of that, and uh, that's where it is. So we just feel that's the best for the team uh, right now. Ryan is Ryan Poles, the GM, who is probably having nightmares about that trade, which I think there are, you know, I think you could say the the San Francisco trade for Trey Lance is maybe the worst trade of the decade so far or, or near Russell the top. Uh, the Russell Wilson trade, the re, the returns of that are, are dreadful. We, we mentioned Jamal Adams. That trade was not great for the Seahawks. But when you just look at what they got 
what they gave up even in the moment it was like that's a little rich for a guy that has been a little spotty as a player and now what it's turned into which is a three ring circus one of the worst trades of the decade uh right near the top of the list for me anyway yeah i'd I'd throw some of the Colts transactions for various failed veteran quarterbacks over the past couple years uh that didn't go well but i mean i'm watching eberflus during that thing and it's just like sometimes if you as you get higher and higher up um, in management, um, in this case, it's like you're going up the, the food chain, and it's like, yeah, it's not so bad to be a coordinator where no one's asking mm. me the tough questions. You got to see. I mean, just watching his body language, having to go up and deliver like a, essentially an editorial retraction. I mean, yeah, it's just an uncomfortable situation. Didn't Stuttering look good. Didn't it. feel good. No. Like that. That was a tough scene. I mean, Claypool. This probably goes without saying, but he gone. He gone. Uh, he'll be he gone. traded for. I'm going to put the over under on a 2024 sixth. I'm not going to even say conditional, just a I'm hard say six. conditional seventh. Okay. I have a prediction where he goes. <laughs> okay. Cause there was reports from Ian over the weekend that one team like that. I mean, I'm sure there's others, but we're very actively um, looking for wide receivers, which was the Carolina Panthers. So maybe they think they yeah, can bring that guy fix this. That's I'm not saying it's going to, I'm not saying it's a magical um, lever pull just that I think that I could see a <laughs> the one guy- team that's desperate for help. The guy that is a team that needs talent, but do they need like a cancer in their locker room? Which it, I get the vibes Claypool because I don't think he, I don't think Mike Tomlin was a huge fan of Chase Claypool, no. uh, the the p- person either. So but I, I don't think be, any team is saying you know what we really need is a cancer to destroy our locker room. So I mean, <laughs> right. it sort well, of comes as a surprise. The, the Panthers, it's like that's a little bit of a sensitive situation with the rookie there and stuff. I wouldn't do it, but you know, I mean the. You Frank, mentioned be crazy trades. Like they put the graphic up tonight when uh, you saw the old lock to Fant touchdown. By the way, I'm still here in the uh, the Chris Wesling podcast studio when Noah Fant was going down the sideline. I was remembering our friend Chris going wild for a little Noah Fant like catching yeah. passes from Drew Lock back when they were in Denver. I once wrote an article. I, I love Drew Lock, but they got Drew Lock, Noah Fant, Shelby Harris in the number five overall pick, who turned into Devin Witherspoon. Whoa. Boom, and then they. What a trade. What a trade. How about that? Yeah, when Devin, Wither- Devin Witherspoon's playing like he played tonight, that's going to quiet all the Jalen Carter stuff as well if they nailed that pick. Um, all right. Finally in the news. Did not see this coming. Nobody was tracking this. Jameson Williams was totally off the radar uh, after his gambling suspension. But the league amended its gambling policy on Friday in a uh, a, new- a news dump, uh, and it led to Williams – uh, having his suspension changed by nature of the new wording to the policy. Uh, he's a first time offender caught betting on a non NFL game from inside team facilities. So that suspension uh, mm. now it, with the rules, it was six. Now it's two and he's already missed four. So that kind of sucks. But uh, the good news is he's now activated and he's, and he's part of the team and uh, the, everyone wants to see what happens uh, with Jameson Williams in this offense because, you know, he's probably the most physically gifted wide receiver on that team. It's just now where is what is his role? Like what kind of player is he as a professional? Because his rookie year was mostly compromised by rehab from a knee injury and finding his way. I know this is tempting, Mark, but because we do work for the NFL, but I think it's different for league employees. And so your plans to go to the Chargers facility tomorrow in Costa Mesa and start wagering on cricket, um, you know, a non-NFL sport. Don't do it. Don't do it. Can't do it. We need you. Foolish. I, it would be foolish, Mark. That's great counsel. Um, I'll follow that. I know we have a off day tomorrow. Um, I, I do feel in a way, because, like, the whole point of this was, like, to try to raise awareness among players. It's like, I didn't know this rule or that rule. It's like, okay, why did they need to announce this now? And I, they, I'm, maybe, maybe it's just, like, they went through the process, they came up with their results, and here we go. But... It brings these players and Jameson Williams primarily onto a sexy team back into our world where you can spend two games telling us why he's back and why the policies change and all the players see it and hear about it. And they found a way to double down on awareness for an issue that they don't want hanging around NFL locker rooms. So it's like you don't have to wait till next offseason for like four more like you know, dingleberries to do the same thing and get caught and find, you know, there were like these rash of fines. Now it's like, let's get it into everyone's head that this is the rule. And like, this was a great way to do it in the middle of the season when everyone's talking about these players and this whole entire thing. Counterpoint, roll out the policy in a clean way in the off season 
and then everybody knows what the situation is, and a guy mm. like Jameson Williams is back in week three instead of week five. Counterpoint, well, yeah. this guy, Mark Sessler, gets it, and he used Dingleberry in a big spot. <laughs> um, one guy that didn't get it, I don't know if we've touched on this on this show, was Greg Rosenthal, uh, the ATN running backs draft back in June. Uh, let's let's uh, take a look at that graphic, see where we're at now, uh, now that we're in October. Okay. Check it out on YouTube. Uh, Mark, I recall having the first overall pick, which is <clears throat> an immense advantage for the Cess dog. And he had Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Derrick Henry, and Ramondre Stevenson. Uh, Dan uh, had, I actually, I think Greg had the second pick, as I recall, and he took Bijan Robinson, Alvin Kamara, Jonathan Taylor, and Aaron Jones. And then Dan took Nick Chubb, Austin Eckler, Josh Jacobs, and Brees Hall. Interest. It's it's kind of interesting, boys. That is anybody doing? I don't think there's a runaway winner. There's, here? <laughs> no, there's it, a lot of unavailable players. Is is this? Oh no! Is this like going to be used in negotiations against running backs? Because I'm not seeing a lot of major I, values here. I think Mark <laughs> wins because he's the one that has McCaffrey and right. And Bijan's been great. Bijan's yeah. been great. Uh, yeah. So, I, uh, I've yeah. been so, I've been undercut by injuries to Chubb and, and Eckler, unfortunately. And Jacobs finally did something and Hall has had moments, but he got Aaron Rodgers. So that was that was a tough one. I stand by my draft, but real football had a harsh reality call for my group. I wouldn't put this back out on Twitter slash X um, or wherever to uh, gain new opinions on this. Mm. Bury it. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Uh, we will be out of your hair uh, for a day, uh, but don't worry. We'll be back on Wednesday uh, with another app, another NFL Plus app Thursday, uh, Thursday Week 5 preview, TNF recap, a lot of good stuff coming your way. Thanks for hanging around. Heed the call.